My sisters and I were real hamster people growing up. I cannot even remember how many hamsters we had as pets. I do remember one special hamster that after we brought her home, we woke up a couple days later to a whole litter of newborn hamsters in the cage. And I was pretty young, so I didn't really understand, but my mom was all of a sudden panicking and frantically scooping out each of these newborn hamsters out of the cage. And I, I, I didn't understand why they had to be separated from their mother, at which point my mom had to teach her five-year-old about cannibalism and that Mother hamsters eat their newborns. Excuse me? But I must have accepted this as a child. I really can't remember. And it hadn't crossed my mind for years until I recently came across this study that looked at hamster behavior and linked their cannibalism simply to eating a corn-based diet, which I know sounds bonkers, but you have to see what these researchers did. Many of us think of hamsters as just cheap, replaceable pets, and we've never even considered where they originated from or that maybe they could survive in the wild. But all over Europe, there's actually populations of wild hamsters, and historically, they were a huge pest for farmers and their fields. And that's because these wild hamsters would just dig a burrow in a field, which meant they were conveniently surrounded by food because they would just collect whatever seeds the farmer planted. And for much of history, wild hamsters really thrived, you know, maybe a little bit too much. But by the early 2000s, people started noticing the hamsters were in rapid decline. In France, it was actually estimated that their wild hamster population decreased by 94%, which is huge. And to add to sort of the mystery of why hamsters were declining so rapidly is that they give birth underground. So no one was really able to study or see could they give birth or were they not even giving birth? Were they not taking care of their newborns? and that sort of thing. So we could only count the hamsters once they were big enough to sort of come out of the burrow. So no one really understood why the species that had done so good in the past all of a sudden was in a rapid decline. Once researchers started digging into this problem, they noticed a trend that the initial drop in hamster population seemed to coincide with this time period called the Green Revolution. Now the Green Revolution sort of sets a time point in the 1950s where before the 1950s, farmers tended to plant a really diverse set of crops. Where once the 1950s and the Green Revolution hit, farmers tended to switch to just planting one high yield crop. Usually this was something like corn or wheat. For example, this region in France where wild hamsters were native to, it's thought that after the Green Revolution, up to 80% of the fields were converted into corn only fields. And what this means for a small animal like a hamster that isn't big enough to travel field to field was all of a sudden their diet was really restricted. In the past, they were able to scour, you know, a bunch of different nuts and seeds and have a really, really diverse diet. But now after the Green Revolution, most hamsters only had one food source available to them. Just how much diet changes hamster behavior is going to be a little unsettling, but that's because we don't ever really think about how food might influence our actions or if it could even influence our actions. Unfortunately for the hamsters, their fate was sort of bound to whatever the farmers planted. So once the idea that the Green Revolution was sort of linked to the decline in hamster population, researchers started studying how different diets might impact hamster behavior. And in one key study, what some scientists did was divide these hamsters in captivity into two groups and one was fed a corn-based diet and the other was fed a wheat-based diet. And the actions of the corn-based diet group were extremely alarming. 
And what researchers saw was that the hamsters fed corn, uh, they would usually cannibalize their whole litter. So when the mother gave birth, she did not give birth in her cozy nest. The pups were just sort of scattered all throughout the cage. And within about a day or two, the mother hamster would place uh, the newborns on top of her food pile as if they were just another piece of food. So very, very, very alarming behavior. But when you compare that to the wheat-based group, which most of their actions were very um, instinctive and normal, uh, the wheat-based group, they, you know, gave birth in their nest. They usually stayed with the pups for the first couple of days and would more successfully raise, you know, all their newborns. Which begged the question, could it just be the food source, corn versus wheat or some other grain, that is making these hamsters into cannibals. If you've ever heard the phrase history repeats itself, feel free to apply it here because it turns out another species was once plagued by a heavily corn-based diet and that was humans. In the American South in the 1900s, it was really common for poor communities to subsist on only corn. And what developed in these towns was a really frightening disease called pellagra. And pellagra starts more mild with symptoms of skin rashes and diarrhea, but later stages include symptoms like hallucinations, paranoia, depression, and insanity. People would entirely lose their bearings. They would act totally out of character. And when doctors came to these towns, they saw, you know, you are, you're eating only corn. Maybe that's the problem and would make um, the diets more diverse and all of a sudden pellagra would be cured. But it wasn't until we had a greater understanding of vitamins or these specific nutrients our body needs to function normally that we figured out pellagra is actually a vitamin deficiency disease. So corn doesn't provide any of vitamin B3, which is funny because corn contains vitamin B3, but it's always bound to another component. So when we eat corn, our body just can't digest or absorb that vitamin. It just goes right through our system. So when people have developed pellagra, it was simply because they didn't have vitamin B3, which made a cure actually pretty easy. You just had to give a vitamin supplement or again, just have them eat foods that contain vitamin B3 naturally. Once the connection between corn-based diets and pellagra was made, the scientists went back to their study of hamsters in captivity. And instead of just feeding the hamsters that corn-based diet, they started to supplement it with vitamin B3. And what were the results? When the hamsters had this additional supplement, their behaviors almost entirely changed. These corn-fed hamsters now they had more maternal instincts. They usually would have their first litter survive and also would go on to raise a second litter of newborns. So this was a huge difference. And when this corn-based diet was supplemented with vitamin B3, there was about an 85% chance of each newborn hamster surviving, which is so much higher than just when they were fed corn. And so it is a little bit unsettling that all these hamsters needed was this one nutrient, this vitamin B3, but without it, you know, their behaviors entirely change. I would love to tie up this video, you know, with a big, beautiful bow and say, this research very likely saved the entire hamster species. The only problem is we have yet to see a lot of this knowledge sort of implemented in changing farming practices and reducing monocultures to impact the wild population of hamsters. So in a way, the hardest work is actually still ahead of us. Hey everyone, thank you for watching. If you have any questions about the foods you eat, leave them in the comments section. I'm always looking for new ideas for videos. See you later.